Welcome to Yogi Views, where my guest is yoga itself, through interviewing those who practice it, teach it, sell it, or simply love it. I am Antonio Sauces. Just as in the Bible it reads, at the beginning there was the Word, and the Word was God. There's an old Indian legend that says that at the beginning there was the Om, and out of its repetition and its reverberance, the Sanskrit was born. Yoga names its techniques in Sanskrit, and it is believed that the vibrational quality of these sounds enhances the effect of the practices. Yet, in modern times, we are witnessing how yoga is being relanguaged, most commonly to either make it more understandable or accepted by the culture it permeates. One of the examples is integrative restoration, or a very modern name for the ancient technique of Yoga Nidra. The man behind this new name is Richard Miller. Hi, Richard. Mm, Thank, around, thanks for being in our show yes. today. Richard is a clinical psychologist and contemporary spiritual teacher. He is the president and CEO of the Integrative Restoration Institute and one of the co-founders, along with Larry Payne, of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. He also was a founding member of the Institute for Spirituality and Psychology and one of the founding board members of the Bauman Institute for the study of awareness and its impact on well-being. Richard is the author of various articles, books and DVDs the most recent book, Yoga Nidra, The Meditative Heart of Yoga. He is also a research consultant for the iRest protocol that he developed and that is studying the efficacy of this method in diverse populations, such as the homeless, people experiencing uh, mm, chemical dependency, sleep disorders, chronic pain, and most recently, veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder, or PTSD. Richard, great introduction, a lot of important names and institutions, but what I want to know from you first is, what is your personal path to yoga? How did you get into yoga? How did you start your own yoga path? It's been a long journey, Antonio. I can remember when I was back to two years of age, when there was a moment when my sister appeared in front of me, the doors, the windows. A moment before I hadn't known any of this, there was just a sense of non-separation without knowing it, and then all of a sudden the world appears to my eyes, and there is this sense of separation that I think now looking back began a long period of inquiry for me because in that moment of separating, it also created a sense of aloneness. And through my childhood years, through my young adulthood, I kept searching for ways back, I think, to that feeling of oneness. When I first came to San Francisco in 1970, as a way of looking to meet people, someone introduced me to a yoga class, so I thought it would be an interesting way to meet some people. So when I came, the, I found out the class was taught in silence. We came into the building in silence. We left the building in silence. For 12 weeks, I never really met anyone. But at the end of the first class, the woman who was leading the yoga class taught a wonderful uh, practice that I now know as Yoga Nidra. And I left the building that evening with a sense of oneness, a sense of non-separation with the universe. And I can remember making a vow to myself that evening that this is what I had been looking for all my life. And I made a vow in that evening to make my life study this process of yoga and to really experience this sense of non-separation and oneness. That began now almost a 40-year odyssey of learning hatha yoga and pranayama, studying the sutras, and beginning to inquire into this practice that I now know as Yoga Nidra. So yours was really an experience. <coughs> it was definitely first an experience. For anything first else. time out the gate. Yes, which is, which is very interesting and, and uh, quite a common fact 
uh, amongst many yoga masters or yoga practitioners. Uh, and it is said that yoga is an experience. Yes. So it's important to, to know that, that that's uh, the way. And so how, how did it continue? Because yoga has different aspects to it. And you are bringing up Yoga Nidra, which is a technique that I'm going to ask you in, mm -hmm. in a little bit to tell us more about it. But that involves the body, but it's not one of those active practices uh, with the body. But yet, Hatha Yoga or other aspects of mm -hmm. yoga, where you're also very well trained and, and very well versed, how did those come into effect in your life? Well, I had the privilege in 1970 of starting to study psychology because I was interested in becoming uh, a psychologist. And I met a woman who had just come here from the Far East and she became my mentor in psychology. But she had also been taught yoga as a child from her mother, who was from the Far East, and she had studied the teachings of meditation and Buddhism. So she began to introduce me and integrate both the fields of psychology, meditation, and yoga. I began to study with different teachers in San Francisco in those early 70s, and I went on to meet a Taoist yoga master a number of different teachers and began to integrate into my psychology practice the, the practices of hatha yoga, pranayama, meditation. So in those early years my practice was actually very, very active. And I began to uh, try to understand the integration of the sutras that I was studying and the Western psychology that I was studying. And with Laura's help, her name was Laura Cummings, she helped me feel an integration, so I never felt a separation between, say, yoga as a psychology and Western medicine as a psychology. Mm -hmm. Along the way, I studied Chinese medicine to get a medical background. I picked up my um, MFT and then my psychology license as a PhD clinical psychologist. And I went on to found a yoga school in the early, about the middle 70s, 1974. And was teaching primarily hatha yoga, some pranayama, uh, beginning to teach meditation, and again, honing my studies. Along the way, I began studying with TKB Desikachar in India in 1980, studied yoga therapy with him. That's when I went on to found, with my friend Larry Payne, co-found the International Association of Yoga Therapy, because in the 19 70s, what I saw was many of the people who were coming to me had therapeutic issues. So I became more and more interested in the therapeutic application of yoga. Mm. But all the time in the background, in all my classes, I was teaching Shavasana and beginning to learn the rudiments of Yoga Nidra. I came on the teachings of Satyananda Saraswati and his book Yoga Nidra. Who recently died. Who recently passed recently on. Passed on. And announcing when he was going to do that and the way uh -huh, he did it I as he to. announced. And so I, I really uh, immersed myself in his teachings. And as I began to teach more and more Yoga Nidra in my classes, I saw my students having profound healings, uh, working with their pain, working with psychology issues, and also a doorway into their own understanding of non-separation and the non-dual teachings. As I began to teach the Yoga Nidra from a more Eastern perspective, it started to occur to me, as a Westerner, I like to discover things for myself. And the teachings that I had been given were often telling me what to feel, what to think, what to see, what to experience. More second-hand information that I was then trying to experience. So as an experiment, I started asking my students, rather than telling them what to see or what to feel in their body, I started asking them, what do you experience in your body when you bring your attention here or here or here? What I saw is they began to have much more profound experiences and it drove them more deeply into their own understanding. So I began to, I would say, secularize the teachings that I had received at a, at a more kind of spiritual, religious perspective of Yoga Nidra, I began to dismantle it and make it a more secular practice, more culturally relevant, re relevant I would say, to, to Westerners. And so I developed it as I'm teaching it now over the years uh, to make it uh, so that I could walk into any audience 
and not, in a way, impose ideas, impose a philosophy, but use Yoga Nidra as a structure for helping a person inquire into who they are, what the nature of reality is. Mm. And this is, this is an important concept because <clears throat> many times we hear masters saying that the true masters are the students. Mm -hmm. And this is a little bit of, of, of what you're saying, that you derived your, your learning from the experience of your students rather than telling them what they should experience. Absolutely, from both my own meditation and my own process of Yoga Nidra and from what I was learning from what they were telling me. Because in those days, I used to go up to Mendocino with my wife. She'd go out for a walk. I'd lie down on the floor for two or three hours, really going deeply into Yoga Nidra, trying to explore my own body, my own mind, my own understanding, and then out of that, take that back to my classes, uh, share that with my students, and then take their experiences and interweave the two. Hmm. Your mix between yoga and psychology perhaps because of me being a psychotherapist, but also because I deeply believe in the, in the profound effects, uh, psychological effects uh, and, and uh, psychological um, uh, issues that yoga uh, brings about and, and, and brings in each one of us. What is, in your opinion, or, or how do the, the two relate? Because also you were a, a founder of this Institute of Spirituality and Psychology, and sometimes for some types or some schools of psychotherapy, spirituality is like, we don't talk about that. And whereas for others, it's a, it's a perfect uh, match or a perfect mix. So how is it in you, or what? I think of the teachings of yoga, and say we take Patanjali's Yoga Sutras, as a series of inquiries or experiments that have been designed to help us inquire into who we are and how we work and how our mind functions. So I think of yoga actually as an exquisite view of psychology that actually enhances what I learned in the West. And the Eastern teachings, you know, they go back millennium, thousands of years. Western psychology is more new, and Western psychology to me is just simply rediscovering these ancient principles, but using new languaging so we can talk about uh, emotions and cognitions. But if I put it simply, I just think of yoga as a practice that is helping us inquire into who we are and to learn how does our body work, how does our mind work, how do our senses work, and I think of the practice as, in fact, the restoration of our senses back to their natural functioning, the restoration of our mind back to its natural functioning. So it helps us um, let go in certain ways of negative conditioning and come back so we're just functioning correctly. Mm -hmm. And I think of that as the job of Western psychology and Eastern psychology, but yoga adds another principle that Western psychology has not yet addressed. I think it's in the developmental evolutionary process of Western psychology. In the perspective of yoga, there is another inquiry into, is there a sense of self or separate ego? Western psychology starts from the premise there's a sense of separation, you there, me over here, and a division. Eastern psychology recognizes that division as a projection of our mind and helps us inquire and potentially what I think wake up the seventh sense. So the six mm -hmm. senses including the mind, the five senses in the mind, to me their job and function is to create and work together to create a sense of separation. But I, I think of this seventh sense that yoga addresses which is the awakening of this feeling or intuition of non-separation. So when I was two years old, I would say my senses and my mind really came online and created this sense of separation. But there was an intuition that there was something missing in that. Yoga, for me, helped me heal that sense of what was missing and reveal the seventh understanding, which is there is no separation between me and you myself in a tree, myself in the world, the universe. We are actually one fabric. We're like the, the root of the hand and the fingers are our separateness, but we're actually one at the base. Mm -hmm. 
And now, when we're really embodying yoga as our felt experiencing, and as you said, I think so, so correctly, yoga is an experience, now we're operating on all cylinders. I feel my sense of non-separation with you, even as my eyes perceive a sense of separation. So you can, I, and I can have this dialogue, I can pick up a glass and function with it, I can use the word I, but the experience inside is not one of a separate I-ness, but uh, a sense of attunement with a sense of oneness or non-separation between you and I. Mm -hmm. An essential uh, concept in yoga for the very Sanskrit root of the term yoga, which is yug, is union. Yes. So, it, and, and it is this union that it is relating to or is referring to. It's referring to it, and I, I think of a slightly different um, uh, um, definition of that word union, which is yoga, to me, is uh, the healing of the misperception of separation. So it's a healing back into a union that has always been here. So it's not a reunion, but a rediscovery or a restoration back to our sense of wholeness mm. that has always been here, but we kind of went away because we became so invested in our conditioning, our six senses. Now, in yoga, we're awake to our seventh sense of non-separation. So it's a union with something that has never been separate. Mm. Yes. This is why some um, masters, and in general, in yoga, it is said that when we practice yoga, we practice to remember that yes. knowledge. Yes. That it's not something new that is going to come out of the practice, something we didn't know, quite the opposite. We always knew it, we just have forgotten it. Mm -hmm. And as you know, it is said that this is the greatest cosmic joke, mm -hmm. that that what we're looking for, we already have. And when we discover it, we will realize the simplicity of it. And we should yes. say, I've always known this. Now I understand what I had forgotten. Yeah. And it is an embodied, immediate impact. And this is a very common comment that we witness in many of our students. Mm -hmm. Oh, I always knew this. Right. This was all, I used to do this when I was a so kid, obvious, people say. Right. Yes, yes yeah. exactly. So uh, that is uh, certainly very important. And in that sense, I would say that uh, Perhaps one of the relationships uh, between yoga and psychology is that uh, they both address this self-inquiry and that is, in a way, the solution to all problems. And you, you bring up then a wonderful point, which is Western psychology helps restore a sense of self-esteem, a sense of wholeness as a, as a well-functioning separate self. Yoga then takes that up from there and now, in a way, helps deconstruct that notion of separation and heal that non-separation. So now we have both a well-functioning personality, we might say, a body-mind that has been restored to its natural, full functioning, full self-esteem, with this new understanding of no separation and, in a way, a deconstruction of the sense of self or the sense of separation. And what I've seen in yoga, it has built into it both what I call this constructive phase and integration of coming back to our wholeness as a functioning human being and this deeper aspect of uh, restoring us to this sense of non-separation and wholeness with the entire universe. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to put you in a difficult position, sure. but I want to ask you something. If it is that we always had that knowledge mm -hmm. and we have forgotten, why had we? There's a wonderful line from the movie Shakespeare in Love. Hmm. And this one character keeps saying throughout the movie, it's a mystery. <laughs> <laughs> My sense there's one yoga text I really love. The translation in English is something like the yoga of uh, astonishment, wonder, and delight. Uh -huh. I think it's a mystery and that when we recover our sense of non-separation and we really feel it and walk around with it, 
It is wonder, delight, astonishment at how we could have forgotten that. Yeah. My sense is we are in a way seduced away from it because when you're in the crib, somebody says, oh, what a cute little baby boy. Hmm. And you're differentiated. And probably, I think you're probably looking out of the crib going, what is they, what are they saying? You know, this doesn't make <laughs> sense. But slowly you're seduced into this sense of separation and, an, and a kind of a cultural agreement, a kind of a self-hypnosis in a way, or cultural hypnosis. Yoga really breaks that hypnotic spell and you recover that sense. And in that moment, as you've so rightly said, we feel, I've always known this. Now I see how I've been dismissing it because it seemed too simple. I was looking for something much more complex. Now that I know this sense of non-separation, I understand the mystery of it, the beauty of it, the mystery of it, the incredibleness of it, the simplicity of it. And I realize everybody knows it. Mm -hmm. And it's not something then that I have to teach to someone. It's not something I bring to them as an outside uh, source. I'm helping them, in a way, dispel that kind of misperception uh, drop away the obstacles to their correct seeing and feeling that inherent oneness. I think it's a very, very simple understanding that everybody, when I go to homeless shelters, when I go into military settings, I see that people can get it almost within a few minutes, hmm. but it's so simple it's dismissed right away. Yes. Just, to me, it's just a simple sense of being. Mm -hmm. Before the mind comes in, we have this just simple sense of being. And in that being, when we really settle into it, we can feel a melting away of a sense of separation as the mind drops. But the trick is then to uh, transpose that into our life and really understand the gift that we're experiencing in this simple sense of being. And, and turn it into a practical uh, piece of knowledge. Yes. <clears throat> because even when, when sometimes you have um, discovered this or, or you have gotten a glimpse of it sometimes during a practice or a meditation or even afterwards or in regular life, then it becomes so difficult to practice it and not to go with all the other conditioning and separation that you were referring to and stay within that unity and within, within that simplicity. Mm -hmm. What a challenge. A challenge that I think if we have a sense of desire, intention, curiosity, wonderment, when we really start to feel the fragrance of what we've discovered, uh, everything begins to pale by comparison. Yes. And what you said earlier, which was once I had that experience, I knew that's what I right. wanted. I have heard my personal experience in yoga was mm -hmm. exactly like that. Mm -hmm. I, I thought life was one thing. When I got the yoga experience, then I knew that that's, that's what I wanted. And I've heard this so many times. And like you probably, a little while later, I fell back into the spell of sense of separation, but I had experienced it. Now I would say I became a dedicated student to trying to understand what happened in yeah. that moment. Yeah. And is it possible to recover that? And, and uh, I think you will agree with this, that it is said that the doors to the knowledge, mm -hmm. the doors to yoga, some say the doors to God, are always open. What includes an advantage and a disadvantage. And the advantage being that we can always walk back in Mm -hmm. The disadvantage being that we can always walk out. And I think that these are times when we naturally, without even knowing how, we just walk out of the knowledge. We do, and, and what I saw as I began to study that, it was how I became captivated by a certain aspect of conditioning. And then the tools of both psychology and yoga became very mm -hmm. integrated to help me heal through those uh, different misperceptions and different aspects of conditioning until that sense of non-separation began to break through more and more and more. And some years ago, it's like somebody flipped on the switch, soldered the wires, and now you could toggle that up and down and it doesn't matter what experience I'm having, that underlying mm -hmm. tone of non-separation just stays in place. Mm -hmm.
Now, Richard, all this talk about separation and non-separation, mm -hmm. this relates to uh, non-dual yoga, yes. correct? So tell us more about that. Non-dual yoga comes from this beautiful Sanskrit word, Advaita, mm -hmm. with an A-D-A-I-V-T. Advaita means not two. I think it's a beautiful word because they're not saying one because our mind would then try to visualize or represent one. Mm. But when we say not two, it short circuits the mind. <laughs> and it's rather than saying union, I like to say non-separation. So it's a sense of non-separation. Mm. Because when I say it's a oneness, the mind begins to build a concept of one as opposed to two. Mm -hmm. But to say not two, it can hopefully break open that, that understanding and reveal a deeper feeling of this sense of mystery or non-separateness. So the teachings of non-dualism, again, I think of as a series of experiments that we enter into through the practices of yoga to try to understand, is this so? It's not a philosophy that we're imposing, everything is one. It's a series of experiments we're engaging in or inquiries to see, is this so? What is my own first-hand understanding? So that means I've got to peel away all my second-hand information that I've been taught and come down to a very deep, I would say, quality of being, intuition, feeling tone, where we're feeling our way into the understanding, but we're not imposing it as my teacher once said when he was asked, what is your philosophy? He said, this was Jean Klein, said, I have no philosophy, that's why I'm a happy man. <laughs> so I, I don't think of non-dualism as a philosophy. It's not a belief system. It's not something we're imposing to believe in. We're actually just using the tools to investigate and come to our first-hand understanding, which makes us very authentic, spontaneous human beings. And when we feel that sense of non-separation, that it helps us that rediscover, I think it, it, it has the propensity to bring an end to war. If I feel my non-separation, and yet there's still this mystery of the senses projecting separation, because you're a unique manifestation of, we would say, non-separation, and this body is a unique uh, manifestation of that. We may have different views and different perspectives, so we may have conflicts. But when I stay in tune with my, my non-separation, I can't do war because it doesn't make sense. In a matter of fact, I might start to delight in who you are and your differences in your particular manifestation and delight in who I am and my personality and how they can interrelate. But mm. I think it would bring an end to war if we were all living in this sense of non-separation. So this was the first part of a two-part show where we are presenting the amazing knowledge and work of Richard Miller. This was uh, Richard Miller. Richard is a clinical psychologist and a contemporary spiritual teacher in the tradition of non-dual yoga. He is the founding president and CEO of the Integrative Restoration Institute. And along with Larry Payne, he is one of the co-founders of the International Association of Yoga Therapists. He also uh, was a founding president of the Institute for Spirituality and Psychology, and a founding member as well of the Bauman Institute for the Study of uh, Awareness and its Impact on Well-Being. Amongst other books uh, and DVDs, Richard had uh, written Yoga Nidra, uh, The Meditative Heart of Yoga, and uh, he is also a research consultant for uh, his protocol, the protocol he developed, the iREST protocol, and he is studying the efficacy of this new method, or old new method, uh, with diverse populations, such as the homeless, people experiencing chemical dependency, chronic pain, sleep disorders, 
and uh, perhaps the topic of our next show with him, veterans suffering from post-traumatic stress disorder. Uh, if you're interested in letting me know what you think, please shoot me an email at antonio at yogiviews.com. I thank you for joining us today and I will see you the next time. <laughs>